Hi, can you tell me who you are and uh, what you're doing here? Hi, I'm, I'm Donald Clark. I'm from the UK, although I'm from Scotland originally, and I'm, uh, I've been involved in the delivery of learning through technology for 30 years. I started a company, floated it in the stock market, I invest in those types of companies, I give a lot of talks at conferences on this, I blog endlessly on the topic. So if you were to ask me what my specialist subject was, it's using technology for learning, online learning, that's my, my specialist subject. All right, we're here at, uh, at one of uh, Switzerland's uh, premier universities for the European MOOC Summit. Um, Zach Sims uh, from, um, from uh, Code Academy at Davos uh, referred to brick and mortar universities, their sports teams, their buildings like the one behind you as the detritus of a bygone era. Uh, agree, disagree, why or why not? What's your take on? You know, he has a point, but in, an, in many ways it's worse than that. One of the reasons that it costs $20,000 for even a standard education per year in tuition in the States or $12,000 in the UK is so much money has been spent on these buildings. And you must remember that the occupancy rate of these buildings is pitifully low. low. I'm in and out of universities all the time. You sometimes can't find a human being inside any of these buildings. Now, who in the right mind would do that, where the buildings are empty for the majority of the year? Because that's true. You know, the holidays are extensive. It's based on the agricultural calendar. So a big component, actually, of running a university is real estate. Now, we've had the equivalent of an industrial revolution, namely an information revolution. Now, surely we should stop immediately building the lecture theatres and spending that money on suitable online infrastructure. When you look at students here, really, they're sitting around with laptops and Macs over in the canteen, learning and working. They're not in these rooms, sitting in rows. I've been lecturing in these, you know, in these lecture rooms. Uh, so I think the whole lecture hall, stop building them, stop building the buildings, don't concentrate on real estate, concentrate on improving bandwidth and mm. online content. So what's your take on the future of that? Uh, we, all, we all remember Sebastian Thrun's uh, declarations about, um, about the concentration of universities and 10 sort of mega global universities left in a de within a decade and Udacity being one of them. What's your take on well, the system? Well, the, the system is clearly creaking away here. You know, we have in London, we had riots where they nearly burnt the city down on the back of student fees. Across Southern Europe, you've got in Greece up to 60% youth unemployment. We have a sizable graduate unemployment sweeping right through Southern Europe as we speak. Uh, and the commoditization, massification of higher education means everybody's got a degree. So naturally, it's not worth what it used to be. That's commodification for you. So the system is under a huge amount of strain now. And I think the MOOC phenomenon, for example, is almost like a steam valve there. You know, there is so much pressure on the old system now that something has to give because they've been massively funded in Europe, certainly by the state. And even that isn't working because the deficits in those countries are enormous. So let's let's dig in there because you made the point in the um, in the session on uh, on corporate MOOCs um, that uh, one of the biggest sort of changes, one of the true innovations about MOOCs is all of a sudden you've got sort of millions of adult learners connected to people working in those em mostly empty halls in the universities with faculty. Um, learning and sharing knowledge and, and sort of creating new knowledge. What's, what's, can you tell us more about that? Sure, yeah. One of the, if you look at the data, not anecdote on MOOCs, the vast majority of the people who take them are not students. They're not 18 year old undergraduates, they're adults like me. A uh, good deal younger than me, most of them I should add. But they, now that's interesting because they are people in employment. They have jobs. They're working in the public sector, the private sector, working for not for profits, all sorts of things. But they are thirsty, massively thirsty for learning. This is six, seven, eight million people who never learn anything in this area suddenly doing it for real. That drop in, not drop out is the most amazing phenomenon. So MOOCs are a bit like Lady, Lady Gaga. I like the hype around MOOCs. And Ant Argawal, the head of edX, said he loves the hype because you don't get that. Hype is marketing. This is what universities don't fully understand, I don't think. You know, the, the hype is good because it pulls people forward. And I like the word MOOC. People say, well, let's forget about the word MOOC. No, it's taken us years to get here. The word has ripped through the, the fabric of education like a fire. Let's, let's stick with it. And what we have here is now a blurring. I don't think it's public sector versus private sector. The two tend to talk past each other. I think it's really about a blurring of the distinction between this notion that you, know, that, that you just go to school, you get a degree and that's it, learning's over. It's always never been like that. The blur is, it's not horizontal layers in education, it's the learner comes through them vertically and continues learning throughout the whole of their life. Lifelong learning, if you want to call it that. Right. 
And that's what MOOCs have provided, it's satisfying that demand. So let me tell you about the situation in the humanitarian sector. So for example, the Red Cross and Red Crescent train 17 million people every year to do first aid. Those people are then going to use those first aid skills to train, to help um, provide support to 46 million others. Globally, the sector, we know that there's some of the, there are growing challenges and not enough people to meet them. So if you look at just climate change, we're looking at 320 million people affected each year by 2015 without necessarily the, the, the ability to sort of face up to that, the capacity to face up to that. We're still training people like it was 1899, one sort of small workshop, you know, one, one classroom of 20, 30 people at a time. Um, what's, you know, um, so LSI.io is a, um, is a uh, talent network created to sort of pull people together from different sectors, wherever <laughs> they may be, um, who could see this, that this is a wicked learning problem that makes a difference, not just for the humanitarian sector, but for humanity. And, and basically an invitation to join <laughs> you know, so the sort of wicked problem solving that we might, we might be engaging in around that. Does this sound exciting to you and interesting? <laughs> what, what are your initial thoughts in the face of the challenge of that magnitude, that, that scale? Okay, initial thoughts. You have global problems, global chain, climate change, which leads to real catastrophes on the ground, unpredictable things, just-in-time phenomenon. That is the very opposite of what education delivers, fixed degrees. If I want to do a degree now, I've got to wait till September or October to start one. That's not your world. You need to do things now. You have a globally distributed workforce and you need a globally distributed network, which is, hey, the internet. <laughs> You have people, a lot of young people who are used to using this stuff now. You also have the victims to take in mind, uh, bear in mind here as well, because you can help people for real in the field, anywhere on the planet, if you put your mind to it. But it needs budget. And this is where you have to stop spending your budget on headquarters and training rooms and lecture theatres and spend your budget on distributed learning. And by that, I mean online learning. And I, I actually think things should go much further than this. I think in the developed world, we should be taking portions of our development budget and spending them on MOOCs, uh, which are contextualized into local languages and cultures and contexts. If you take Africa as an example there, I think it's quite patronizing to deliver English-only MOOCs across the whole of Africa. Remember that the whole of Africa, Northern Africa, for example, speaks one language, and that's Arabic. Why don't we have Arabic content? Because that's what people really need, not a second language experience or educational colonialism. And I think the MOOC thing, if it's done correctly, and we're sourcing some of it locally, locally as well, may break the back of educational colonialism, as well as this notion that everything has to be in these absurd buildings in, uh, in it, that, that are costly to get to, costly to stay nearby, and costly on tuition.